Okay, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Um, and welcome to everybody joining online as well to um, this event on young people's recommendations uh, to enhance accountability to children across sectors. So I will, I will go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome again. I'm really, really pleased uh, to have you with us and um, to welcome you on behalf of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action and the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility who are co-hosting this event. Uh, my name is Susanna Davis. I am the global co-lead of the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group at the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I'll be co-facilitating this session today um, with my colleague Joyce Mutiso, who's just two spots down, um, who's deputy coordinator from the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. As you can tell, we work really closely together, so we're really pleased to be able to do this together. Um, we are also very pleased to have all of you in the room and online with us for the next 90 minutes. Uh, to explore the role of diverse actors in ensuring humanitarian action is accountable to children. As those of you in the room have already gotten a taste, this will be an interactive session. So we will start in just a few moments by discussing some of the barriers, the challenges to supporting children's meaningful participation. We have a fabulous panel to my left. Um, of experts from different sectors and backgrounds who will share their experience in supporting accountability mechanisms in a diverse range of humanitarian contexts. And there will be group work where you will get the chance to interact with our panelists, ask them questions, and also practice some of the approaches they've used um, to facilitate children's participation in different humanitarian responses. We've got flip charts, we've got colored pencils, we've got all the things that you would expect child protection colleagues to have. So we hope that you're ready for it. We hope, and don't worry online colleagues, there will be an activity for you as well that will be facilitated by my lovely colleagues from the Alliance. So we hope that you can bring a bit of that energy and a bit of that mindset of a child into the session. Um, and finally, we're really privileged uh, to have my colleague Bonaventure Sokpo from the Core Humanitarian Standard with us, and he'll, he'll give us some, some closing remarks uh, to wrap us up for the day. So, why are we here? Accountability to affected populations is one of the key areas of common concern for HNPW this, this year. I was just at another really great AAP uh, session from Ground Truth Solutions this morning. I think there are upwards of somewhere between 30 and 50 sessions around AAP uh, and related themes this year. Um, and we all sort of acknowledge when we talk together as humanitarians that if we aren't accountable to affected people, if we don't listen, if we don't reflect their voices, and if we don't work collaboratively together with communities in how we deliver humanitarian action, we can't achieve a response that is appropriate, that's actually meeting people's needs, that is effective, that is sustainable, quality, or safe. We all agree on that. It's not controversial to say so. But are we really delivering on that? I think based upon many of the other discussions I've, I've joined this morning, many of you would also agree that we're not. Um, and I think interestingly, for those of you who attended the opening session, uh, the online one that was last week, you will have heard um, Under Secretary General Martin Griffiths giving us um, quite a distinct call to action for a step change in how we deliver humanitarian aid. And within that, he called on us to listen better and invest in communities. In a number of recent global and country level consultations with children in humanitarian settings, they are issuing a very similar call. Um, and I'm gonna share with you a few quotes from some of what the children in those sessions um, that covered, I think, about 15 different countries, I'll just have a short sampling, um, what they have said. They ask, will you pay attention to children's needs and voices? 
Many expressed frustration that they are not routinely consulted nor have the opportunity to influence the assistance they receive, despite being very aware that it is their right to participate under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. A refugee girl from Ukraine um, in Poland told us, adults often forget how it felt to be a child. The challenges they had to overcome in their everyday lives. That is why they have to learn more from children when planning actions that are designed to solve our problems. Another boy from Syria who was living in Iraq told us, we ask for safety, education, and the chance to be kids, even in challenging times. Children are 40% of those affected by conflict and displacement worldwide. And in many crises, children and young people are actually the majority of affected people. So the, and we also know that the impacts and effects of crises on children are more long lasting as their brains are growing, their development is, and is influenced disproportionately by adversity. If we're not listening well to the voices of, in some cases, half the population of affected people, particularly to the unique needs of children who are at a vulnerable state, but who also have agency, who also have preferences and, and ways that they want to interact, then can we really tell ourselves that we are meeting our obligations to be accountable to affected people? Um, most humanitarians from a range of different sectors and roles acknowledge that consulting with children is important, um, but express concerns and raise the many different barriers to doing so. And we'll give you the opportunity to share what some of your perspectives are on that as well. Some of the things we hear is that there are limited resources, limited capacity to facilitate con consultations, or concerns over the potential risk, concerns over safety. Um, therefore, the existing accountability mechanisms that are there, where they are true accountability mechanisms that have a feedback loop and not just one-off consultations, um, we often find that they're mostly focused on adults and exclude the vast majority of children. Where there are tailored accountability mechanisms specifically designed for children, they are usually designed by a child-focused sector like child protection and education, and therefore don't always reach all of the rest of humanitarian response, which maybe has control over other things that children want and need beyond protection and education. You will hear examples um, shortly in our panel that there are many colleagues already working to overcome these barriers and to strengthen children's meaningful participation in humanitarian action. It's not all doom and gloom. There are best practices occurring and there are people who are actively working to address this. We hope we'll be able to share some of those examples um, from my colleagues from the International Rescue Committee, who have a global initiative on accountability to children, um, from Ground Truth Solutions, who's joined us and has recently supported um, some work with children in Burkina Faso, and we'll share some experience from there and also from the International Organization for Migration, who will share um, some of the work that they are doing together with interagency colleagues, particularly around strengthening women and girls' participation. The Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action also has an advisory group on accountability to children that's doing a number of different pieces and working really closely with the child protection area of responsibility, who's, as you can see from this session, also prioritize this as an area of work. There is a great deal of work to do. Um, we hope that this session today will be a space of exchange and learning um, and where we may also learn from some of you about the pieces of work that you are doing or learn from some of you about areas where we might collaborate. collaborate. All of which is to say we hope this session is a beginning um, of a growing consensus and an increase in work in strengthening accountability to children. Um, the aim of this session is very much to demystify accountability to children if it is new or worrying to you, to clarify its critical place in effective quality humanitarian programming, and to encourage all of us 
to take action in our different agencies and roles to ensure children's voices are heard and reflected in humanitarian action. Um, I will leave it at that. And I am now really pleased to hand over to Joyce, who's going to lead us through our next segment, where we also hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, good afternoon um, to those who are present here. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to those who are online. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. As Susanna has mentioned, I'm Joyce Mutiso, Deputy Global Coordinator um, for the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, which is a long blah, blah, blah name for cluster coordination <laughs> for child protection. So if you're familiar with cluster coordination, humanitarian coordination mechanisms, I'm here representing the child protection part of it at the global level. As Susanna has mentioned, this session is going to be interactive. So we'll start off by hearing from you, um, those who are in the room and those who are online, on your perceptions of barriers to child participation and youth engagement. So one of the things that we hear often is we don't know how to engage with children, we don't have the skills, we don't have the know-how. But we want to dig a little bit in today into that. So the, we invite you to um, scan the link that's up on the screen. It's a Mentimeter link. I hope we are all connected to the HNPW Wi-Fi or some other form of connection. And we have a couple of questions that we would like you to share some feedback on. The first one, as you will see, is what do you think child participation in humanitarian, why do you think it's challenging? So as I've mentioned, people give reasons as to why they are not able to consult with children, they're not able to engage with children. Um, so we would like to look at a word cloud um, from those online as well as those in the room on what you, why you may think this is the case. So we'll start with that first question. Let's wait for the word cloud to come up and then we'll move to the next one. Okay, so I'll read out some of them. One is lack of practical tools. Um, we don't know how. Inability to change design. Danger of traumatizing, that's very heavy. Access challenge, too much hassle. Imagine that. Protection concerns, we don't have time. Gatekeepers, very interesting. It costs money. Compliance rules seem firm. Lack of trained staff. Okay, let's move to the next one. And the next question on the Mentimeter, which I hope you can see, is what do you consider to be key knowledge and skills that all humanitarians should have on child participation and accountability? So if we were to do it right, if we had the time, if we had the money, if we had the patience, what are the skills and knowledge that you think we should all have as humanitarian actors to engage with children in a safe and accountable manner? Just learned a bit more technology. It's right in front of me instead of me trying to get a nice break. Okay, it's too small for me to read. <laughs> I need to start wearing uh, progressive glasses, it seems. So communication, understanding developmental stages of children, patience, language skills, child-friendly language, Listening, the UNCRC, this is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Susanna alluded to earlier. 
age appropriate approach, the ability to listen, empathy, data privacy, do no harm, child's first language, very interesting, Systematic inclusion, trauma-informed. Again, very heavy. Trauma is a word that's used um, sometimes very heavily. So thank you very much for taking part in the Mentimeter. I'd like to hear from the group in the room first, if anybody would like to elaborate more, share an experience based on the two questions in terms of why do we think it's challenging or the type and knowledge of skills that we think we would like to have? If you want to say something more than just posting on the word cloud, and then we'll go to the group online. Any volunteers? Yes, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just sitting from the IFRC. I managed to use uh, component. I think part of it is um, part of the challenge, I think, is that you know, we need to speak to young people and children where they are, not where we are. So, you know, we're not going to expect them to come to conferences like this. We're not going to expect them to speak to us at nine to five. We need to speak to them on weekends, week, you know, at where they are. So I think there is a, there's a business model that we have to shift our mind to in terms of where they're going to go, right? The second thing is that if we're going to listen to young people, we also need to be prepared to act on what they're what they're doing, right? So we need to be prepared to follow up with their acting. So if we're going to give them agency, let's give them agency, but let's follow up as well with that. And I think, again, there's a reluctance for us to do that. So we just instrumentalize young people, get them to nice panels, and then that's it. I think if we really want to listen to them, we need to be prepared to act on them. Thank you very much. Very important points. One about managing expectations and how we conduct those consultations with children. They do expect a lot. If anyone has had experience with doing consultations for children, they will tell you anything and they'll tell you about anything and everything during the consultation and not necessarily what we always want to, to hear. So that's a dilemma that we have to deal with and not run away from. Anybody else in the room before I go to the colleagues online? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Tia with JRNY Consulting and we often do things like child-led evaluations or youth participatory action research. And the thing that we hear from our partners most is that they're really uncomfortable with not knowing what's gonna happen. Um, so when we say, when they say, well, what's the budget look like? And I'll say, well, well, we don't know. We wanna know what these, your primary stakeholders wanna prioritize. So let's just wait and hear from them about how they'd like to allocate funds and where they think it should be spent most. And I think there's a lot of discomfort in saying, oh, I'm not going to know, I'm not going to have control over the process, when actually the process is about giving up control. So I think that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot when we try to advance these types of uh, methodologies. Very well said. Anything that involves inclusion, participation, does require giving up something. And there's a bit of a fear of the unknown around that. Um, last one in the room, please, and then we'll go to the colleagues online. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. I couldn't agree um, more with you. And I think what also comes to mind is that um, we don't, we often don't see children as the agents of change. So we come and do consultations and then we, we go back and um, make sense of the data and then formulate rec um, recommendations. But often we don't um, take a step back and just let um, children and young people um, make sense of the data and speak on their own behalf. Thank you. That's Eva from Ground Truth Solutions. Sorry, I missed to introduce myself. Thanks. Thank you very much. Colleagues online, um, Camilla and colleagues, is there anyone who would like to speak online, please? Any online participants, please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to come in. <laughs> or, or we it can seems move we have on. some shy people yeah. uh, online, but hopefully we'll warm them up. Okay. Rooms later. That's, oh, I see a hand. Oh, no, we now. Have Here we now. go. 
Yes, please come in, Minya. Hi there. <laughs> I think I just wanted to say also that I think the main uh, shift that we need to do is to think about, to not think about child participation as an option. And we don't think about um, beneficial participation as an option anymore. Uh, but for some reason, we still seem to think that we can do this or we can't, you know, that's that it's up to us to decide that. But I think that's what we need to step away from. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's a good way to bring us to the end of this uh, Mentimeter session, which is to say, if we can do it for adults, if we are patient enough, if we have the time, if we can look for the resources, if we can find the skills and knowledge to do it for the adults, why not for children? And I think I'll leave it at that uh, with that resounding message and I hand over back to Susanna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Joyce. And thanks to everyone in the room and online um, for your participation in this bit. It's not, it's not over, guys. We're still, the group work is still coming. Um, but before we get to that, I have just the utmost privilege of introducing this lovely panel that's next to me. Um, so we have, first to my left, I'm going my direction, so sorry, no stage directions. Um, we have uh, Valentina Shafina from the International Rescue Committee. Um, we also have Meg Sattler from Ground Truth Solutions. So I've skipped over Joyce if you're trying to follow <laughs> along. Um, and then um, at the end, we have Agnes uh, Tilinak and also Amalia Torres both from the International Organization for Migration and their global team um, to support camp management, all of whom will be sharing the different pieces of work that they are currently um, pursuing on accountability to children. I would now love to let them introduce themselves in a bit more detail, far more interesting than me speaking. Um, Valentina, would you mind going first? Sure. Um, so it's introduction of me and uh, basically yes. for the bit on the work. All right. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening for everybody who is joining online. My name is Valentina. Um, as was mentioned, I'm working with IRC as a client responsiveness technical specialist. For some of you who might not have heard about client responsiveness, it's the IRC approach IRC framework uh, to accountability to affected people. We purposefully talk about client responsiveness, uh, the recipients of the support we uh, see as our clients, including, including children and client participation, if more involvement of clients, especially in the profit sector, uh, is critical to any success of any business. So this is how we see our work as well. Um, so yeah, should I hand over to the next person or? Yeah, I can hand over then to my left. Meg, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Meg Sattler and I'm the Chief Executive of Ground Truth Solutions. Um, it's really nice to be here because I actually, some of my first ever accountability projects many years ago were with children. So it's really nice to sort of come full circle. Um, but at Ground Truth, we've been working on this question of accountability for over a decade. Um, engaging communities to hear how they experience humanitarian action and how it can be improved. And we do this um, with a host of different local partners via a combination of perceptions-based research and also participatory advocacy. And previously, up until a couple of years ago, we only really spoke to people who were over 18. And we did that more or less as a protection measure, I guess. Um, but a couple of years ago, having noticed the sheer number of children affected by crisis, as you mentioned, it was actually one of our colleagues internally who really challenged us on this and said, it's kind of not good enough that we just say it might be complicated to engage them, we have to work out how to do it. Um, and so we started working a couple of years ago on a project in Burkina Faso, um, where 2.5 million children were affected by crisis. And our team just felt it was really important to find a way for their views to be included in our work. So I'll talk a little bit more about that project later. 
Um, but overall, we're sort of learning through that process that children and young people have a lot more to say um, than they're currently sort of listened to. And I'll hand over to, to my left. Thank you very much, Meg. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Agnes. Uh, I am uh, working for uh, IOM, um, the global CCCM uh, team in, uh, in headquarters. So we do camp coordination and camp management. Um, and uh, I'm a protection officer embedded uh, in our CCCM operations. Uh, so I'm working mainly to integrate uh, critical cross-cutting issues in our operations so that we do uh, good programming, safe programming, and inclusive one. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation today to, to join this panel. When you were talking about demystifying child participation, I could really recognize uh, myself and see how also we can contribute to this discussion because we've been through that also at the CCCM level. Thank you again. Thanks, Agnes. This is Amalia Torres, also from the IOM Global CCCM support team. Um, so perhaps just to add uh, on what Agnes said, so since uh, participation is at the heart of what CCCM does, we have some initiatives ongoing uh, at the global level, but also at the operational level. One example of them is the Women's Participation Project, which is a project that uh, seeks to strengthen, strengthen participation of women and girls during displacement. So uh, some of the lessons uh, learned and experiences that we will share today come from this particular project. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to have this range of perspectives um, from a client responsiveness model and an agency like the International Rescue Committee that has um, robust children's and women's uh, protection programs um, to uh, an organization like Ground Truth Solutions. And it's so fascinating to hear that you were challenged internally, that it wasn't good enough, um, and also that you responded. Uh, because we know we are often challenged in, in many ways in humanitarian settings that our programming, what we are delivering is not good enough and the ability to actually shift is, is not something that one we should, we should assume. We, we know that many th times things are raised that we don't shift to. And to also hear how uh, camp management colleagues are approaching it from an inclusion and a participation perspective that that's very much at the heart and critical for the work that you deliver. Um, I'd love to start by, by asking a little bit uh, for a little bit more detail um, and to go in, uh, in depth with some of our panelists. So maybe I could turn to, to Meg first. Um, you mentioned um, the work that you started in Burkina Faso a couple of years ago. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that and particularly like the, the approaches that you did use with children and, and what you found from that work. Sure, happy to. Um, so we started working a couple of years ago with partners, primarily Terre des Hommes. I don't know if anyone from TDH is in the room, um, and also with a range of local partners um, to develop this child perceptions project. And we wanted to find out what children thought about the humanitarian response. So we consulted over 200 boys and girls um, to try and learn what changes that children would like to see in their daily lives um, and how humanitarians could support some of these changes. Also to help address their needs and their aspirations. Um, as I mentioned, this was quite new territory for us, so we learned a lot. We used qualitative research methods to try to unearth children's priorities without imposing them. Um, I would say we got that somewhat right, so we've learned a lot about how we might do it next time. Um, but we used um, activities around play, movement and images. We also used a collective social environment mapping technique, which my colleague Tim is going to demonstrate for many of you later in the interactive section. Um, and in this methodology, the kids basically charted their surroundings, pointed out what was important to them and what things they thought they would like to change. And we used that as the basis to sort of build up the research. Um, the first study from that came out last year and it was a report called Burkina Faso's Youth Speak Up, if anyone wants to Google it. Um, and it highlights just some of those changes that kids want to see. I think a few interesting things that came out of that one was really that children aren't participating and they don't necessarily feel that they have a right to participate. So that sort of, in a way, makes the whole methodology a little bit tricky and means that you have to really look at, you know, how do we 
sort of get to a stage where people, young people feel like I actually have something to say on this topic and I'm going to be listened to. Um, they also had quite concrete recommendations or asks where they, for example, needed bicycles to get to school. Um, they were aware of some of their rights. So one child told us I have a right to health, which I found quite interesting. Um, but a really eye-opening thing for me was also some of the commentary on just how important it is to kids to be kids in emergencies. Um, and one of the things that I really liked was there was a, a finding about how children felt it was so important for them to celebrate and how they would pool their resources to have parties together. Um, and that's the sort of thing that explaining that to a donor would sometimes be complicated, but is so important to this protection question for children. Um, and they also, as was mentioned earlier by someone in the room, this dilemma about they're going to talk about things that aren't necessarily relevant to the humanitarian system. They had many ideas and comments and things to say that went well beyond the remit of the study. Um, and that I think just made it, it made it complicated, but it certainly taught us there's a lot that we needed to adapt in our methodology to mm -hmm. sort of allow for that, but also to know what we could take from it. So reflecting on the first phase, I think it was a first phase. We were quite proud of it. It's been picked up quite a lot in Burkina Faso. Um, I think we definitely could have gone a lot further in considering children as more holistic beings than aid recipients in some of the, mm -hmm. the questions that we asked. So in that sense, when we had a first draft of the report, it was quite similar to some of our adult reports, which we were sort of surprised by. And I think that pointed to a bit of a limitation in our own methodology. So we've learned a lot from that. Um, and we're looking now at the second phase involving many more sort of participatory methodologies, not just for the research, but for the advocacy that goes alongside it. Um, one thing we didn't have in the first round was children actually co-writing the report, which we thought was something that would be really important to do in the future. Um, and we've also now got a lot more buy-in from various local organisations to engage in the uptake and advocacy part, um, as well as focusing a lot more on the global advocacy part. So we've been engaging a little bit with Joyce and colleagues on how we can do that. So I'll stop there because I think I only had two minutes, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Sorry, thanks very much, Meg. I think you covered quite a lot in two minutes, so well done. I think fascinating both to hear about their priorities um, from the very basic and practical, which you could probably convince most donors that it's a good idea for kids to have bicycles, um, to the more, the inherent nature of being a child, which shouldn't just be practical which should be about play and being silly and frivolous and that that was something that re children really treasured. I think that's a um, that's something that we might not get and might not be prioritized in all responses, but that is really critical um, just to children's well-being. Um, and I think also really interesting to hear some of the things that you are learning and how you are adjusting as you go on to children being co-creators potentially in a next phase and also to looking at the uptake and advocacy. It's wonderful to have a report. It's wonderful to have these findings, but to see how we actually get colleagues in the response to act upon them. Really great key points. So I'd love to shift a little bit and turn to, to Valentina now. Um, I know that IRC has quite a lot going on in the accountability to children's space and to children's participation. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on and maybe similar to Meg, what you're learning. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, as I mentioned, uh, and maybe just to start as how we like to put everything in different sectors and buckets. So um, we do have a team on client responsiveness and we do have a team in child protection. So when we started and both of us, both of our teams do recognize the gaps on child participation, but somehow until now, our collaboration was quite, quite minimum. So I think uh, what is critical and I hope uh, it would be really interesting to like kind of like scan the group that we have in the room that we have online how many people we have who identify themselves maybe as practitioners experts on accountability to affected people community engagement and how many people identify themselves as uh, child protection uh, experts and how many of them feel comfortable to say like I feel comfortable working in both areas 
Um, and this is, I guess, the challenge when it comes to um, accountability to children, to child participation, that uh, it does involve uh, risks. Uh, it does involve uh, certain uh, systemic gaps on knowledge and capacities of colleagues that we have uh, either working specifically in child protection when it comes to uh, AEP area of expertise and other way around when we have AEP uh, experts uh, who don't feel comfortable stepping into the area of child participation. So this is exactly kind of this uh, borderline, uh, and I'm talk not talking about research. So I think uh, we, we currently have a project uh, funded by BHA uh, where we are exploring these systemic uh, gaps uh, when it comes to uh, accountability to children, why we have so many literature, why when you Google you have so many resources from different agencies on child participation, but how come we're still in this room and a lot of people list barriers that they see in their work and uh, don't say that tomorrow I'm ready to do and set up at least basic system on child participation in my organization, why we are still in this situation. Um, and again, like not maybe going into the area of research, I heard that colleagues in the room also with GTS, we do have a specific rich literature on the research, but again, this is research. We don't do heavy money invested research every day but we do humanitarian assistance every day. Mm -hmm. So how we can uh, operationalize and systematically have uh, accountability mechanisms for children from the perspective of uh, using the methods that they prefer, collecting information that can be used for the decision-making and actually following up on this. So while some of this is of course about methods on accountability to children, it's also the organizational structures that we have. Uh, it's not so much, I mean, not so much. It's not only about information that we collect from children, it's also from adults how much information, consultation, engagement, methodologies we have and how much data we sit on, but how much do we use it for the information when we design the projects for the implementation. So uh, there is like two, two sides of this coin or basically two areas that we have either from the perspective of inclusion of children, but at the same time within the organization, how we do inform decision-making, uh, participatory design, even with adults as well. Um, so currently, again, partnering with our uh, amazing child protection colleagues um, at the uh, technical units and also in country programs, we will work in uh, Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. We did not agree on this with GTS before. <laughs> it's just somehow both of us. Uh, selected uh, like were called um, in Burkina Faso to work on this topic. Um, so this is currently our, our approach uh, to look at this, uh, not in the silos together with our colleagues from child protection team, um, also with the uh, advisory group uh, set up by the Alliance, we will talk about it a bit later as well. Uh, and just the last point from my end, um, also to say that uh, there are child and youth led organizations in the communities where we work, but somehow, again, this is the area that where maybe child protection colleagues feel more comfortable to engage with, barred uh, from the position where I see it on client responsiveness, uh, AEP community engagement. Uh, we don't go to these groups that often, and uh, this should be the first uh, one of the first uh, entities agencies the way we go to to engage in a more systematic kind of like business process models that we feel comfortable working with and this is definitely something to identify and do local partner mapping and identify where those entities are already in place instead of setting up something new but yeah i will talk about it a bit later as well thanks very much valentina i think we it's quite nice to hear the shift in the way that you're framing things as looking at accountability to children and children's participation as a way of working, not a one-off event of, of research, which is, is still important and is certainly needed in some cases, but that this should be, I think, as you were saying, folded into our business model. Um, and looking particularly at how we're doing so with child and youth-led organizations in, in in many communities where those those do exist and those are there um, as a way for for engaging children um, and I, I really enjoyed also um, and I think we'll we'll get back to this in the discussion at some point but your I know that we had on on our Mentimeter one of the barriers that some colleagues lifted up was a, a lack of practical tools 
And Valentina, coming from within this sphere, has just testified that, that there are huge, just an insane number of practical tools. Um, and, and we will share a website where you can find some of them if you're, if you're unaware. But the, the lack of awareness of them or the lack of willingness to, to pick them up and actually put them to use is, is also something that we have to somehow get over that, that hump. Really great points for us to reflect on. Um, so I think very, um, as a last specific question for one of our panelists, not certainly not least, is maybe I could ask um, Amalia. You mentioned at the in your in your introduction some of the the work that um, IOM and camp management colleagues have been doing, particularly on women and girls' participation. Um, I wonder if you'd like to tell us a bit more about that. And also, um, I think you touched on it a bit in your introduction, but if you'd like to expand on why, why for you, for camp management as a sector, accountability to children, it's, it's very clear that it's coming across as a key priority for you. Why is, why is that the case? I will let Agnes respond to this one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so, yeah, and let me start maybe with a disclaimer. Uh, as we said, we are not child protection specialists. Uh, we do uh, camp management. That's, that's great. That's why we want you here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, however, I mean, we recognize that it is critical uh, and that uh, we need to engage uh, further with children and be uh, further accountable to them. So that's yeah, why we're in this panel and uh, that's what we, we're going to try to share with you. CCCM, so camp coordination and camp management, is there to ensure that displaced people, displaced communities, have access to protection and assistance uh, during displacement. And as you mentioned, Susanna, uh, children represent more or less 40 percent of the displaced population worldwide. And in some countries we work in, uh, in the sites, we have even 50% of the population of the sites who are below 18. So we cannot do camp management without taking a child-sensitive approach uh, on a daily basis in our operation. Uh, we can do it, but we will not do a proper job. We will not do quality programming if we don't take uh, child consideration, uh, child-sensitive uh, considerations in our daily uh, work. One thing that is uh, interesting about uh, our sector, CCCM, um, is the way it is structured. Uh, CCCM also cannot work without the participation of the people. You cannot manage a camp properly without the population displaced taking part in the governance, in the activities, in the decision making, in all aspects of the camp life. Okay. And so this participatory approach, we have been taking it from the beginning and we've had uh, then the possibility to develop, uh, experiment, uh, share new approaches so that everyone in a camp could participate. We talked for years around participation and participation of all, but we often realize, we quickly realized that in the end, it was always the same people participating. Elder people, men uh, who had already a lot of power. Uh, and that, for instance, women were left out of these decision mechanisms and children, boys, girls, even more. And so uh, back in 2016, we started working uh, together with the Women Refugee uh, Commission, actually, to develop uh, a methodology uh, that uh, Amalia uh, mentioned briefly, uh, that turned into a, a project that is now one of our flag flagship uh, initiative in IOM and uh, at CCCM uh, level two, um, which is called the Women's Participation Project. Uh, the idea of this project was to uh, strengthen uh, the participation uh, of women in displacement sites uh, to support uh, them so that we could hear their voice better uh, at site level and beyond, of course. But from the onset and from the development of this methodology, we also realized that we had to include girls. Uh, girls were not uh, sufficiently represented uh, in these processes. Um, and we decided to put the focus uh, on adolescent girls specifically uh, for a few reasons, because of lack of confidence also, probably as a sector, we were a bit reluctant to engage with younger children. 
uh, but also indeed like probably the lack of safeguards also uh, at this time uh, and a number of considerations but so we really decided to put the emphasis on the, the participation accountability to girls um, and we've been working now for almost 10 years uh, in many places around the, the world to, to, to help uh, raise their voices and engage uh, them uh, in the site uh, and uh, ensure that our responses uh, are more accountable to, to them, uh, to their needs, and, and respect their, their rights too. So these are uh, where a few points. Um, there are many other ways. Uh, we could keep on discussing for, for, for hours, even as a non-specialist, uh, of course, and there are so many things. We can talk about safety audits uh, that we're doing with children in sight uh, uh, to uh, how to ensure that these uh, audits, this methodology uh, are adapted also uh, to them and how we can do better programming on our site. Um, these were just ideas, I know, only two minutes, sorry. Over. <laughs> Thank you very much, Agnes. I think it is it is particularly nice in a panel discussion like this and on this topic to hear from non-specialists, um, people who do not who don't have a master's degree in children's protection or development on how how they are adopting this and how they are um, adapting like w other ways of consultations and as a, as a way of working noting that like for the model of camp management it's not possible to do so to achieve it without participation so thank you very much um i know we are are slightly over time for our panel and we want to safeguard the time for our group work um, but i am going to perhaps invite our panelists um, to very briefly and if i can give you the challenge of doing so in sort of a minute or less for one key takeaway that if everyone were to leave the room right now one key takeaway that you would want them to have a lesson learned that you have from your work on accountability to children something that children themselves have have told you to to pass on um, but i'll invite each of our panelists to to come in um, just for one minute or less so maybe i can turn to to amalia and agnes at the end first Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. So um, I don't have like a quote from children, but uh, rather a short, very short anecdote uh, that came in uh, one of our CCCM uh, annual retreats a couple of years ago. Um, it was a specialized on child protection NGO that was working in a displacement site that actually had collected data on children's needs and preferences, displaced children's needs and preferences. But um, th so they had all the data, but then they didn't find the space in the camp governance structure where this data could be brought at the table so therefore the needs and um, ideas of children could be brought into the camp management no so sometimes it's not only about having the information but it's also uh, trying to see in which space in camp management mm -hmm. this information can actually inform the way we uh, do what we do so in terms of key uh, lesson learned or takeaways for our sector, um, I think sometimes we uh, tend to be a bit reluctant, as uh, Agnes already started uh, explaining, to engage, with, especially with younger children. I think there's a, primarily because of this fear or this potential of harming. Um, but we need to remember as a sector that this uh, fear or this reluctancy doesn't take out our responsibility as a sector to engage with displaced children and adolescents because they are part of the displaced community, right? So we need to uh, see how we can further adapt our way with, of engaging with these groups so they can meaningfully be part of the camp management and also that our own camp management practices are more accountable. Over. Thank you very much, Amalia, and I really appreciate the push that it does mean that we have to engage children of different ages and, and children in all their diversity. Just consulting with one small subgroup is not going to give you the breadth and complexity of, of children's needs. I think that's a great push for us. Um, Meg, can I challenge you for your one minute or less? I mean, I think one, one challenge for all of us, as with any of this type of work, is that if you're engaging children as with anyone, you can't engage them for nothing. And as we all know, I think the fastest way to erode trust with anyone is to engage them and then not do anything with the results of that engagement. 
Um, and the reason I wanted to say that is that we're in a really challenging funding environment at the moment. And so that's really tricky because as we've just heard, you know, doing this properly requires money and time and things that we don't often have. Um, I think that might require creative solutions like the one that Valentina suggested, you know, how do you sort of incorporate this as much as possible in ongoing work? Um, we're working currently on a sort of light touch approach, hoping that elements of it can be picked up by various practitioners. But I think conversely to that as an advocacy point, not listening to children in this age of prioritisation, given the sheer number of children who are affected by crisis, um, is not ethical. So I think discussions like this, where those of us who are working on these issues can coordinate, um, help Joyce do her tough advocacy asks with donors at the global level is really important. Um, and there was a quote that came from our Burkina Faso research where a girl um, said, we can't give our opinion because we are small. If we were adults, it would be better. Um, and I think it's important for us all to just keep that in mind. Thanks. Thanks very much, Meng. I turn now to Valentina for this challenge. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, just before having this kind of like key message, I just want to um, refer back to what uh, Agnes shared uh, regarding their work and uh, uh, really highlight that it's extremely important and uh, um, call out the work that uh, our team from uh, Women Protection and Empowerment colleagues are also working uh, to add another layer of diversity on inclusion of uh, adults and girls with intellectual disabilities in partnership with Inclusion International. Uh, just to not to make the world even more complex, but just to realize that uh, there are different uh, approaches or inclusion lenses that exist uh, in the camp settings or any areas where we work. And it is critical to recognize them and not shy away from these complexities, but actually just go ahead and figure out how to do it. Um, so I, I'm quite sure my colleagues will be sharing more about their work and uh, also demystify this area of, uh, of, of work as well. Uh, I love what they're sharing, and I think it's uh, in general about adolescent, adolescent girls, but uh, specifically their uh, recognition, as they're saying, that if we were children, that would have been better, uh, we would then be better positioned to influence decision making as an adult. Uh, especially when it comes to youth and adolescents, somehow they are taking responsibilities when it comes in, in the household, taking care of their young siblings, taking care of their uh, older parents, but somehow as an adolescent, they're not recognized as decision makers, even though they contribute significantly in the well-being of the community and the well-being of their family and households. So it cannot be true that they cannot be involved in the decision making. Mostly it's because we set the time of, we set the age of 18 years old, which is also very, let me put it, European centric and not representative of the uh, how other communities, uh, especially where we work, are set up and functioning. So it's very unfair just to put this uh, age limit, uh, mostly from the uh, protection areas as well, which is very important. But again, we need to find the ways to address those uh, difficulties without causing harm. Um, so uh, yeah, this one area to share and the key message is uh, in this room, uh, I would say, being a change manager in your organization or basically being more vocal with your senior leadership with the decision makers that there is an area that is just not uncovered or present in your organization and uh, start at least from your roles uh, to go and discuss these topics because uh, it will not come across themselves because again uh, power sharing localization is a difficult things to do to drop some buzzword in this panel as well uh, but this is something that uh, all of us need to start work on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Valentina. I think you've given us um, two important calls, both on embracing and adapting to complexity. We have that capability as humanitarian workers. We, we all deal with donors and meet insane requirements. We can adapt and embrace complexity and to be able to do that also when it comes uh, to children's participation and how we um, do that within each of our roles and to be an advocate within our own organizations. I think certainly those reflect well some of the, the key points we wanted to get across with our panel and particularly around the points that accountability to children is, is everyone's responsibility. It can't be left in the hands of, of 
experts from whichever end you're deciding or experts um, but um, needs to be a collective responsibility and a collective challenge that we meet together hopefully so with that i'm really happy to hand over to joyce to introduce us to our group activity and i hope you'll still have some energy and also the opportunity to engage the panelists directly um, in just a moment uh, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, uh, panelists, uh, and thank you, participants. I hope you found um, the contributions from our panelists very interesting, that you're learning from them. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce um, some group work that we're going to have. I'm trying to see if there's a slide behind me. Uh, no slide. So we are going to go into four groups, um, three in the room and one online. So in the room, we'll have one group that will be led by our colleagues from the camp coordination and cup management team so elena exactly thank you then we'll have a second uh, group that will be led by uh, the international rescue committee so valentina here she will move towards you so you can find your space and then the third one will be led by a group ground truth solution sorry which is led by tim tim is right there so i think you can all uh, come around him if um, you're interested in that. So in the camp coordination and camp management, we'll be looking at an activity around site mapping. So trying to make things as uh, operational as possible within this room. And then with IRC, we'll be looking at a dream tree activity. And then the third one uh, with ground truth solution will be on social environmental mapping. Um, so we are going to convene at 1520. Um, back together i don't think we are all we're leaving this room so we just move to different locations within the room and then on the online group our colleagues from the alliance camilla and team will provide instructions on that so we reconvene at 20 past the hour thank you okay so i think hopefully you can hear me online Although I can also see I'm visible in the room, so hopefully they can sort that out. There we go. Yes, yeah, so um, welcome to those who are joining us online. Um, we will spend a bit of time now um, demonstrating for you and taking you through some activity, an activity or two that you can use with um, children. Um, and then we'll return back to the main room for the closing remarks from the CHS Alliance. So don't go away. Um, so yeah, we'll first take one in plenary. Well, we'll take a short one, light one together that was gonna be in plenary. And then we'll take another slightly longer one where we'll ask for a few volunteers. What we'd really love is if you could put your videos on if you feel comfortable, um, because the first one's a bit visual and the second one, it would just help us to see um, see your reactions, see how you're finding it. So, do so please join the groups and the then the on. group leaders will give you the... <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to be using some activities from a recent Save the Children resource, um, which is called Children's Consultations in Humanitarian Settings. It's very practical, lots of guidance and lots of tools. So you can see sort of step by step descriptions of the one we get, ones we're going to use today. Um, and also, um, yes, plenty, plenty of others. So um, I'm going to be joined by a couple of colleagues from the Accountability to Children Advisory Group. So I'm from the Alliance Secretariat and I co-chair the group along with Sanjana Karupu from IRC um, who co-chairs the group with me um, and then also Capuchin Tibi from Ground Truth Solutions who's a member of the group. Um, so it's just to let you know who will be um, with us today for these activities. So I'm just going to hand over to Capuchin for our um, initial activity and we do have a slide if we move through um i don't know capacin if you want to use it but if you do please just ask kira to flick through to it uh yes please let's uh go to this slide uh hi everyone so we're just gonna start with a little bit of a simple exercise and a bit of a warm-up which you call, which is called sit kneel and stand um so it would usually be an activity that um you only kind of need 20 10 minutes to do to gather children's opinion on um specific uh, topic and uh, usually you would ask uh, a question to children and uh, if they agree you ask them to stand if they disagree to kneel and if they're neutral about it for instance to sit 
Uh, so we're gonna try this together um, with a bit of a focus on uh, the HNPW. Um, but maybe we're not gonna sit, kneel and stand because that wouldn't be very practical uh, in this setting. So what I suggest instead is that we do thumb up if you agree, middle if you don't really know our mutual and thumb down if you disagree. So my first question for you is, uh, how easy has it been for you to join uh, this session? And please um, thumb up, thumb down, or uh, middle ground. Okay, I see some thumb up here and there. Amazing. Um, okay, great. Then next question is, um, how useful do you find the HNPW for your work? I see some middle ground, but also some a lot of thumb up, which is great. Um, amazing. And finally, last question, because I think you kind of got the idea of this little warm up and exercise is um, how good is HNPW for networking? Amazing. Um, okay, then I'll give um, you back the floor, Camilla. Thank you, Capazine. That's great. So that one um, is a really great one because it can be done with any age, like even littlest children can, can understand that one. We're now going to move to one that's a bit longer and is for slightly older children. So anyone from eight upwards um, takes around 45 minutes if we were doing all of it and doing it for real, but we're just going to whip through the first bit and then uh, explain the second bit. Um, and it can be used for a couple of purposes. So it can be used to prioritise the problems children face um, and it can be used as part of preparedness, anticipatory action or project design. Um, and it can also be used to gather data on children's preferences and priorities more widely. Um, and it's quite low resource as well. I mean, Susanna mentioned the things they have in the room. Um, we're doing an online version. So obviously, if you're facilitating something online with children as well, it's quite simple. Um, and again, I've put the source there, um, which should be in the chat box for the, for the actual tool it's from if you want to read more. So we were looking for about five volunteers to take part. Um, so if I could have uh, five volunteers to um, pop their hands up perhaps, um, and then we can uh, take you through the activity just to make it manageable with such a big group. Um, and then we'll screen share a, a Jamboard now so you can see what we're going to do with the dot voting. And we're gonna stick with the topic of um, Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Week and this joining this session. So it's completely neutral um, topic. You don't need to have any experience at all with child participation, child protection, anything like that. Um, anyone can volunteer. So can I have five volunteers? Yeah, Emma, Danelle, Helena Minchu, what, Patricia Osana. I hope I'm pronouncing the names right. So that's three. So if I'm missing any others, a couple more volunteers would be great. Can't see any other. Um, Marcello as well. I think we'll manage with four unless there's one other. So and then Julie Niederhoff. Okay, great. All right. So Pedro, if you can screen share our Jamboard, and then hopefully people have been able to access our volunteers have been able to access the link through the chat box. So we're going to have a look at problems you may have experienced in joining today's session. So can one of our volunteers um, suggest what problems these pictures might relate to? Any ideas? Marcello, Julie, and the others who volunteered. Um, uh, different languages. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you might have struggled with it all being in English, perhaps. Who else came off mute? Was that Marcello? Connected yeah, to I was going to <laughs> we'll come to you next time. Yeah. <laughs> come in, Marcello. Um, yeah, so so identify the uh, the priority in in uh, needs and other area. Priorita yeah. Prioritization. 
Yeah. So could you make time for this session and the whole 90 minutes, perhaps? Patricia? Uh, yes. And the, because, of course, the one that Marcelo mentioned uh, is linked to uh, having six sessions at the same time in the HMPW. So you need to prioritize also among those. And uh, the last one, um, if you are like free of uh, family uh, task or responsibilities at that time. Yes, it's a public holiday here in the UK. I don't know if we have any others. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I think I heard someone also say connection. We've got someone here who's experiencing real floods in, in Kenya at the moment, one of our co-chairs. So, um, yeah. OK, so um, what we would do is we'd add um, into those sticky notes and I'll ask Pedro if he's able to do that to just um, pop those different um, names underneath. So you'd invite the children to do that. And then do we have any other problems that people might have experienced today? Maybe one of the volunteers can suggest if there's any other problems people might have experienced with joining the session today. I, there's a difference between being in person and being online, of course. So maybe, yeah. you know, being able to physically get to Geneva is impossible for everyone, even if that might be a preferred way of participating yeah wouldn't it be great to be there in the room for sure we'd be uh packing out that room um but yeah it is then a bit tricky isn't it sometimes to to always hear everything and see I don't know about you guys I was like this is there on the panel so yeah there's there's also a problem there um okay so we'd have um noted all of the um points in the sticky notes so just to get the children um engaged and in doing something um, if they're, if you know, the literate children anyway. So now I'm going to invite each of my volunteer children to, to move one of the stars, just one at this stage each, onto what they think is the biggest problem out of the five that we've identified. If you can drag and drop. Oh, one where of can stars. we find the stars, Camila? Can you see them? Ah, on okay. The, yeah. I know, I see them. Super. Them. Sorry, yeah, so we've got <laughs> one vote so far for prioritization, competing priorities. We've got another for um, family commitments getting in the way. Um, so three, three people have identified the competing priorities, whether it's lots of emails or having six amazing HMPW sessions at once. Thank you for choosing ours. And I think there's just one more person left to vote. OK, so if you can each take one more star and vote for the one you think is the second biggest priority. Out of family or like life responsibilities, priority, prioritization, connectivity, language and problem of getting to the venue or problems with enjoying to the same extent as those in the room if you're in hybrid. OK. So we've got nine stars. So I'm going to invite you all to now vote for your third choice. So you should each vote for three, but you can put two stars on one if you think that you'd like to spend two of your votes on one to boost it up higher. OK, so just a few left to vote. We can get those two last stars voted across okay okay so it looks like as a group we've chosen prioritization and competing priorities as our top problem um, for this hmpw session and then the second um top problem is connectivity issues and the third is sort of personal obligations um, making it hard to, to prioritise again. So those are our top three um, problems. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Are there any others that are missing? Any others that you didn't think about before um, that, are, that are missing? Just give a minute in case there are. Okay, if not, 
I'd like to just ask, explain that if we were in the room with children, we would also want to ask if there were any smaller problems um, that people, that the children might be able to identify. Um, because, for example, when it comes to child protection issues um, or kind of tricky issues that might affect a smaller proportion of the group, um, then they might um, not be seen as big problems by the group. And they might not always come out in the first round. Um, but some of the more sensitive issues that we want to, to pick out, we can bring out um, by asking if there's any smaller issues that might just affect um, some children. So it's good to give space to that as well. OK, so once we've got those um, all, all out, all the voting out, we can then take the children through the next few slides, which would be about identifying why these are problems. OK, so taking the top three that they chose, the prioritisation, the family and the connectivity and, and kind of working through them. Why are these problems? And then the next slide, when we've done that, we'd be looking at what are the solutions? How can they be solved? And then finally looking at um, who has the power to make change in relation to these problems? OK, so I hope that was useful. Um, We'd like to just um, ask you, anyone now in the room, not just the five volunteers, to reflect a bit on that activity. It was difficult for us to choose um, this activity. There was another one called the H assessment that we really loved. We thought was very relevant to um, a lot of the work people are doing on accountability to affected populations and therefore that they could use for accountability to children work. But in relation to that dot voting one, I'd love to hear some reflections from the group about you know, any concerns you have about it, any any kind of positives, negatives you think about that in relation to some, to some of the discussions we had um, earlier in the session. Um, we've got about four minutes before we go back to the main room. Minya, please come in. Just a quick reflection. I don't know if that really connects to what you wanted to get out of this, but I, one thing I was thinking of when I saw the picture is, you know, how important also representation is. And for instance, you know, that you have a picture that goes from the left to right, whereas in other countries you go from right to left, or that picture of the family, which is a very nuclear, you know, kind of family setting and might not be representative to everyone who sees it. So it's a lot to think about also, even when we have pictures. Yeah, it's so funny you said that because Googling from the UK, it was so hard to not find a white family or a typically, you know, I tried to find a more blended family in terms of race and that's why I ended up going for the family who you just saw the, the shadow and the backs of them in shadow but as you say even then it's a it's a clearly sort of western sized nuclear family for sure yeah definitely a really good point I mean the images also help to make it easier for children who might not be literate so that was just to also explain the why we had the the images and then we had we would as we could as a facilitator especially with the younger group we could write down what they what they said just as a visual aid but maybe with the older group, you might be inviting them to do the writing. Helena, please come in. Thanks. Um, I noted that we we didn't note um, living with disabilities and how, you know, we said language, but maybe that could also be translated to not being able to hear um, or a visual impairment that makes this a difficult um, activity to participate in. Um, and so you might not, have people who feel comfortable or confident saying, talking about disabilities. And then I also wondered just as a facilitator, how you kind of push for more challenging concerns. Cause obviously this is a very quick version of this, but we, you know, we didn't do those other concerns and you wonder if someone might feel confident bringing up something that is sensitive to them. Um, so like, what's the length of time? What are the questions that are asked? Thanks. Yeah. And you can also set that up. And so in the accompanying tools to the Save the Children resource that we, we've we shared, there is, um, you know, risk assessment and um, accompanying tools that help you to also, if a child did disclose abuse, you would then have a referral person, you know, available on the day so that they could seek support from that person. Um, and you could also ask, you know, tell them at the beginning, we, we would happily hear from you if you are experiencing any of these issues like abuse um, at home or in the community. So you don't need to share them in the group. Um, 
So you could still identify challenging issues, you know, like people being hit in the in the food distribution line, for example. Hopefully that's not happening. Um, but but they could also be told that they don't need to share those things in the plenary and um, perhaps, disc you know, even discourage it um, and tell them how to report those things instead. So it sort of depends. But if it, it depends how you want to set it up and what kind of conversation you're having and who's facilitating it. Um, but that guide does cover off all of that. Um, Minya, I'll come to you. And then um, if we could also hear in the chat box um, from someone who'd like to volunteer to report back uh, whether one of the people who were going to facilitate Sanjana Tapazine um, or from the volunteers who, who participated. Minya, please come. Um, did you want to come in, Minya? Or maybe we're running out of time, so maybe we need to head back into the main room. But if you'd like to share quickly, I think you'd have time. Maybe just super quickly on what you just said. I know that Mike Wessels used to always talk about, you know, that we it's okay also to talk about it like a third person and that, that can sometimes help when you talk to children so you can talk about you know have you seen or heard someone who has or you know does your has mm -hmm. your friend and then it doesn't become so personal uh, so yeah. that that could also be a, a technique to use yeah i would say it very much depends on who's facilitating and what you want to focus on so we're child protection practitioners we might feel more comfortable identifying that but again it depends on the size of the group whether you're going to how much you're going to be able to follow up with that group afterwards, how much you trust the children to keep the confidentiality of the topic. Um, so, yeah, in general, you know, it, we've been looking at maybe more general issues in the community and then looking for those things that affect them personally to be shared with the facilitator separately. OK, did we have a volunteer to report back in the plenary when we hear from the online, the in-person participants? Uh, thanks, everybody. Susanna was saying, um, for those who are online, that um, if you didn't hear that, one of the favorite things is to convene uh, group work that people are reluctant to leave. I think that's a good sign. Um, and just in the interest of time, first of all, thank you very much for indulging us and uh, participating in the group um, discussions. We'll start with the online groups, uh, the group online group, sorry. If we can have one volunteer, maybe to just share your take, your feedback, or something that you've learned from the group work. It's not a summary of the discussion, it's rather your personal perspective or lesson that you have picked from the group work. Um, anybody online who would like to speak, please raise your hand and um, Camilla will let me know. Do we have a volunteer? It'd be great to just share some reflections, even if there that there weren't enough time. <laughs> Julie, please come in. Um, so in our group, we did a, a couple of interactive ways for kids to sort of vote or express their opinions. And I thought there were some really interesting ways to do it that um, didn't rely on a high level of literacy or language um, and also involved, hopefully, some kids moving around and interacting, which is always good when you're working with young people. Thank you. Um, and in the room, I'll give um, the space to two people to share their um, take or lessons since we were a larger group uh, within the room. Any volunteers? Yes, please. Um, hello, my name is Talatu from Fact Foundation in Nigeria. Um, I really um, enjoyed our session. I learned that there's um, a very innovative way and like to reduce um, the need for conversation and actually rely on visual cues, uh, having um, the children point out things instead of you know, expressing it, because then it, re it reduces a lot of awkwardness, a lot of shyness in the community. But then you ask the question and then you ask them to point out something on a map or something like that. And then it kind of like gives uh, you like a clear and concise understanding of how they um, attach meanings to certain areas in where the, in their environment. Thank you. Thank you. And one more volunteer from the room. Don't be shy. <laughs> you weren't shy during the group work. Anyone? Yes, please. 
Um, we worked on the mapping. Is it social environmental mapping? And I just think um, it has a huge amount of potential because, as the facilitator was saying, it's so open. So you could just use that as an entry point for many, many different types of conversations. Um, and you could, I guess, try and just, you know, have have whatever kind of goal in mind. It could be, you know, linked to a kind of a safety mapping or an accessibility and inclusion um, type, you know, approach, or it could be around um, risks or it could be around needs. Or So it seems to me like a very good kind of starting point for many different discussions that you could have. Um, and you could kind of tailor it to different time frames and different ages of children, I think, as well. So I thought it was quite good and quite simple. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, with the exception, give one last speaker a chance to share, please. Uh, I just wanted to say it was really wonderful to, to do the role play and to just take over, you know, being a displaced person for some minutes. I think it's a valuable experience. We should all do more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you speak to one of the um, skills and knowledge that was spoken to, which is empathy, to try and put yourself in the situation that others may be in. Um, so just to say that I think um, from the group work, what I've grasped is about language, about the diversity of how we make inclusion possible, how we make participation possible for children, and just to have a bit more empathy. And I, during the group work, I was discussing with Susanna about, I was asking the question, do we actually share enough of what others are doing in terms of child participation and youth engagement around? We keep saying the tools are there, but are there examples there for us to learn what is possible to be done, what is already out there so we don't have to duplicate, uh, we don't have to cause participation fatigue. Um, so as a way of example, um, from this link and from the code, we are directing you to the Alliances um, page um, on uh, accountability to children. There's actually a working group that the Alliance leads um, on accountability to children. We're trying to move this ahead as child protection actors. So if you'd like to learn more, please visit the link. We won't have a Q&A session, but some of us are available in the room and later on online if people have questions um, to ask us. So you can look at the HNPW session and see um, the contact details which are there uh, to ask us any questions you may have in case you wanted to raise something and we don't have a Q&A session. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your participation in the group work and I'm going to hand over to Susanna for the final part of this session. Thank you. And all I'm going to do is invite my colleague Bono Sokpo from the Core Humanitarian Standard from the CHS Alliance to come up and he's going to give us a few closing remarks before we leave. Great, thank you. So I was saying that we were put in the shoes of young girls. That was very good. I just wanted to say I have read something saying we have all, we have all been a young person at the moment and we can remember the frustration when we are in the situation we want to say something but we are stopped not to say it so for my closing remark i have three points to address one is about the culture the second one will be the expert or non no expert and my last one will be about the culture and standard of i work for chs alliance we have just gone through the chs revision let me come back to the first one when i'm talking about culture when we will we will have the the willingness to address this accountability to children we will face two things culture in which we are working and culture in our organization so first is you might face a, a resistance in the in the culture you are working with when they don't give um, the floor to children normally and then an organization coming to want, wanting to do that, you will face that, that uh, difficulty. And if we, in our organization we don't have, we have not created this culture of uh, accountability to children, I have heard many times the tools are there. You can create a lot of tools, but if there is no culture to apply it, that will never be applied. I'm trying to come back now to expert or non-expert. I want to put that into a context. I was working, uh, I was doing a review, we were a review team in North Uganda. 
where children, uh, uh, the proportion of children in uh, that area was more than 50%, close to 60%. And then we had, we remarked that there was no children in the committee that they have, well, they have created to take decision. There was children in none of the, the previous work consulted. We decided, because I want to say we were lucky, we had a, a, a save the children person in the, in the review team said we wanted to see the children. When the children, they knew that we were coming, it was amazing. They prepare a, a welcoming uh, ceremony and not, not only that, so what was very good for us is that when we went to them, they did the ceremony and then they told us how they would like to see the, the camp changed. So I want to say they had ideas. They know what they want, but they also know that they won't be heard in the culture that they are. Uh, no one will talk to them. Every time they, they, they say something, they, they heard that, oh, they just want to play. You know, so, so they were not listened to. Just, I'm saying that, and what happened is that we asked organizations who were working that what is happening, showed what these children have, have just described as their, the way they see the, the camps. And then they say, ah, we don't have a specialized, a specialized organization uh, here working with children. So that was a shock for us. So what is the, the, this message is saying? If we don't have Save the Children or any specialized organization, then we don't take care of more than 50% of the, the population of the, of the camp. So that is not acceptable. So, and I'm, I'm coming back now to the core humanitarian standard that have, have been revised. In the revision process, inclusion came strongly in the revision process so strong that you will see the, the first the, uh, requirement in the commitment one, the 1 1.1 says, ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations are integrated into the organization work with people and communities with attention to most marginalized. What that means is that everywhere you are, and then you know you can identify uh, people at risk of being marginalized, you need to build your capacity to work with them. So what uh, the CHS is trying to do is not, we are not saying that this is for save the children, this is for disabilities, or this is, everyone working somewhere needs to create it or his capacity to work with people that can be marginalized, including children. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for, for this, and thank you for the session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone online, and thank you, everyone in the room. Have a good evening.